Welcome back. This is Miss V, and we're back for another edition of History with Miss V. And today we are in a new unit. This is Unit 11, um, Quarter 3, Unit 4, and we're discussing imperialism. But first, uh, we need to discuss what caused imperialism around the world. And also, we'll get into later in the unit what were the effects of imperialism on various um, parts of the of the world, especially Africa and Asia. All right. So this is guided notes eleven point one. So let's get started. All right. So this is our standard here. Basically, you want to be able to analyze, as I mentioned, the causes and effects of imperialism. However, if you're ever able to identify the cause um by the end of this unit all right so your challenge for the lesson so where i want you to be for the lesson is to be able to identify as you see here with the arrow the causes of imperialism if you know what caused imperialism that would be awesome for this lesson all right so let's continue here are the vocabulary for this unit um, you will not have an actual activity associated with just vocabulary, so that's why it's included in this lesson. So I wanted you to make sure that you have this vocabulary, get this vocabulary written down so you know exactly what it means because we're going to be using it a lot throughout the week. Okay, Imperialism, as you see here, is extending influence, um, especially through domination by force or subordination. So that means that they make someone... Um, subordinate to you you have to the the nation has to answer to that dominant nation right um colonialism is taking control of a, a nation and turning it into a colony under that nation's authority protectorate as you see here is controlled or protected by another nation usually a weaker nation um and then spare of influence is when a country um, has power to affect certain developments but they don't necessarily have authority over it and we're going to use a lot of these words a lot so um let's continue and you'll see what i mean all right so your question number one asks what major e event allowed for the increase of european colonization and that major event was industrial revolution because they have access to all of these machinery and this manufacturing. Now they're able to, they want more basically, and they are able to get more, okay, through the use of machinery. So because they exhausted all of their natural resources, trying to build these manufacturing companies and these manufacturing technologies, they had to go elsewhere to try to find these raw materials and these new markets that they were looking for so that they can begin trading things and trading goods, right? So as you see here, gone of the days of the glow, glory and God, right? Well, we talked about that in, in exploration. Now there are major um, wealth reasons for this, right? So that's your answer for number one. And number two's question is why did European nations become imperialist? As again, they began, they exhausted all of their resources and now they need to seek um, other resources in other areas such as raw materials and markets. All right, so that's number one and two. All right, so here's number three. What are the two economic reasons for imperialism? Now that you, the industrial revolutions have changed the game, there's two reasons why European nations became imperialist. And these are the two that you need to remember. Raw materials and new markets. So as you see here, here's my little M&M. &M. Hopefully you remember that when um, we're going through it. And also, as we go through, we're going to play a little um, I Spy game. Every time you see the cause of some one of these european nations going in to imperialize or using imperialism and you see the reason i would love for you to spot out the m m right new materials new markets right so those are your two reasons for number three 
The two economic reasons for imperialism was raw materials, they needed natural resources to go into the factories, and then new markets to sell those products that they made in those markets or those manufacturing uh, factories, right? All right, let's continue. All right, so this is number four, five, six, and seven. And it's a lot to cover. Now, and here's where it gets a little tricky, okay? Um, European nations used excuses, which is what they were, used excuses, and it's not tricky, it's just what it was, okay? Use excuses to justify why they should take over these nations, okay, and take their resources. And here are the three, there's three C's, right, in terms of how European nations use these excuses to justify, to meaning that they are saying that it's right for them to imperialize, right, other nations other than Europe, okay? So for number four, those three C's are competition, Christianity, and civilization, okay? So let's go into number five. What was European nations looking for to compete with other nations? So European explorers knew that places in Asia and Africa had a lot of raw materials and new markets, right? That they can sell these new products from. So Africa is so rich in different material, raw natural resources such as oil or petroleum, right? And they have other natural resources such as gold and diamonds and so forth. So they knew that they can get those raw materials right and then in africa itself that there would be markets to sell them to within africa itself so in order to increase european nations wealth they figured that that would be a good option to go into places like africa and also asia has a lot of natural resources as well in order to boost their wealth up but they figured here's the next thing your number six how did europeans use christianity to justify imperialism they saw people of african and asian ethnic ethnicity as heathen and by heathen we're meaning a person that does not believe in the philosophies and the the, the laws and traditions and dogma of Christianity okay so their thing that you European nations right their belief was that okay if we go into these countries and we take them over now we have an opportunity to convert their souls and make them right under Christian ideals right and now they can go on more missions during the slave trade to convert the people of Africa and Asia into Christians because now they're saving their souls, quote unquote. Okay, that's number six. Number seven is a little bit more, not a little bit, but a lot to be honest. Okay, it's a lot more racial propaganda for lack of a better word, okay? Um, so, number seven was how was civilization used to justify imperialism, okay? So, according to Darwin, Darwin believed that, and he studied animals in terms of adaptation, right? And how they were able to move from one evolution to the next by merely adapting to their environment. Okay, social Darwinists believed that there were certain groups that were able to adapt better to their environment than others. 
So they believe that certain groups were better or more likely to survive and adapt to their environments other than some other societies. In this case, they believe that Africans and Asians and other non-European ethnicities were least likely to adapt to their environment or to adapt to the change of modernization and industrialization. And therefore, because of that, they are more likely to be controlled or imperialized. Okay? So hopefully that clears up what the justifications that Europeans ma nations made to say that they figured it was okay to control other nations okay so that's your answer for four five six and seven okay let's continue um, this is number eight nine ten and eleven so I'm gonna walk you through everything here so now, of course, now that we know why Europeans were conquering various nations and exactly how they manipulated belief around and made, made excuses to say that it was okay to do this. Um, eight, the three forms, they did it in certain forms and formats, especially through Africa, Latin America, and Asia. Okay. Um, one of the forms, the three of the forms that we have here are a colony they use protectorates and sphere of influences okay our sphere of influence for number nine um what must the people of a colony do they have to obey the foreign laws okay because under a colony imperialism is the actual concept that is uh the belief or the idea okay putting imperialism into practice is colonialism or establishing a colony so that's the actual act of doing imperialism okay so people under a colony have to obey the foreign laws and they ha they're ruled by foreign leaders from away right they learn the foreign ways and they trade with the foreign power okay so they are under the control of that dominant nation as an authority right but the dominant nation is the imperialist nation okay so they are the actual they are enacting that concept of imperialism hopefully you understand that i know it's a lot to chomp on but we're gonna get into more and see the practice so you can understand that clearly okay um number 10 a protectorate what does a dominant nation receive uh, with a protectorate? They, ex they receive exclusive trading rights. So the key word here, as you see here, is to protect. So in a protectorate, that foreign power provides protection for the quote unquote, and I'm using for lack of better words, the weaker nation, but those local rulers remain in charge sort of they still have some level of authority not much but they have some okay and in exchange for that protection they do they have to have exclusive trading rights right and also maybe that they establish some type of military blockade so the local ruler would agree to use their military on behalf of the of the dominant nation as a protectorate for both themselves and the dominant nation okay so that's what the protectorate is um, number 11 what does a dominant nation receive with the sphere of influence so in a sphere of influence um, the dominant nation doesn't necessarily have authority but they do get as you see here exclusive trading rights in a certain area or a certain part of that particular nation or country um, they get trading rights so they may control certain ports or certain um, railroad systems or certain entryways where that they can with where they can trade okay and 
that is their key here with a sphere of influence. They have that influence to exclusively trade in certain parts of that quote unquote weaker country. Okay. So hopefully everybody, uh, I hope y'all get eight, nine, 10 and 11. And those are the three forms of imperialism and how you're going to see that play out in certain areas in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Okay. All right. So here is number 12, three forces. What are the three forces that allowed European imperialism to occur rapidly? There were three things or three events that allowed imperialism to occur. And the question is here, how can a relatively small portion of the earth, Europe is pretty small, right? Compared to Asia, compared to Africa, Africa is huge. Africa is the second biggest continent in the world. Okay. How can such a small portion of people on the earth and a relatively small population be able to conquer the earth's largest continents? right and there were three forces that made that happen again here the berlin conference of 1884 the industrial revolution and also technological advances that came out of the industrial Revol revolution so let's move on so you can see how that happened okay all right so this is number 13 this was one of the first ones we talked about the berlin conference in terms of those forces right um, what was the purpose of the Berlin Conference? Well, Otto von Bismarck, which is now the ruler of Germany, because remember Germany unified, so it's no longer Prussia and different independent German states, right, or nations. They all combine as one giant country now called Germany, right? And Otto von Bismarck is now the chancellor uh, of Germany, okay? And he organized this conference, um, which was called the Scramble for Africa. And all of the major European powers, this is the answer for number 13, attended this conference and they literally took Africa and they divided up Africa, the continent of Africa, in terms of who, which nation, European nation is going to get what portion of Africa, okay? So just like you cut a piece of cake, that's exactly what was happening in Africa. It was chopping, you know, chopping it up into certain parts, dividing it up into certain uh, countries and uh, estates or what have you, so that Europeans could have that control of the natural resources in that area. All right. And as you see here, a big problem is that no African representatives were either invited or attended this meeting or this conference okay and it's going to have unprecedented effects on africa and you'll see that when we get into talking about imperialism in africa okay and we'll talk more about that later too <laughs> you'll see all right um so the industrial revolution, as you see here, and we've done, you know, a lot about industrial revolution, but as we mentioned before, from the last unit, cheaper raw materials, cheaper energy, right? They have the materials and so forth in order to manufacture. And now because they're able to manufacture at such a cheap rate, they're able to build things, right? that they can eradicate certain diseases right and now they are having a head start on modernization and now they're using that to their advantage to go into other places that may not have that technology okay and now they're able to forge ahead and dominate other countries that may have those same resources that they need for them for their machines to be able to control them, okay? All right, and this is 14, technological advances. So the technological advancements, as we mentioned, that happened in the Industrial Revolution allowed the scramble for Africa or that Berlin Conference to be even more successful. How did that happen? Well, as you see here, the Maxim gun, 
um, that was used to help dominate African armies. They were able to go on this big gun and tank and, you know, take out different um, warring tribes, okay? One that comes into mention would be um, Shaka Zulu and the Zulu Nation in South Africa. Shaka Zulu did put up quite a fight against the British for a long period of time. He pushed against British imperialism in South Africa, but eventually, of course, South Africa was able to take uh, the British, sorry, the British and the Boers, which were the Dutch, were able to get control of that area, right? Um, the railroad, railroads were built um, in in Africa, right? So they were able to use a lot of technology to clear out in the savanna and, you know, the tropical rainfall, you know, jungles and so forth in Africa to be able to lay railroads. And that allowed for a quick communication and also resupply of things like machine, you know, this Maxim gun and also quinine. Okay. Quinine, as you see here, which is a picture here of quinine, right? They were able to manufacture things like quinine because they figured that it had some form of mosquito carrying proponent that would allow, well, sorry, they were able to find out that it treated malaria, which is a mosquito carrying disease. So if they were able to have this quinine and quinine and deliver it over the railroad and get that resupply, then they were able to live in those conditions in Africa, okay? And that's what allowed um, European nations to be able to get into Africa fairly quickly and make the and control Africa, okay? But again, there were other issues, there were other proponents that allowed European nations to have that control over Africa as well, and we'll get into that later. All right, um, number 15. How did imperialism affect Africa? And this is just a tidbit. Again, we're going to get into more with Africa. But initially, imperialism was used for slave labor, right? And that slave labor helped and pushed European nations towards an industrialized, industrialized nations, right? But these industrialized nations once the slave trade ended in slavery, most of their slavery ended in the mid 1800s, they took a new interest in getting those resources that they needed for their manufacturing in Africa, okay? And they used the technological advances, their excuses, which was racist, racist ideology, and also their lust and their need for raw materials to conquer Africa for decades, okay? And to this day, Africa has felt the effects of this politically, socially, and economically to this modern time, okay? Which we'll get into in um, lesson three, okay? But for now, hopefully you get an idea of this the causes of imperialism. This is your exit ticket. It's almost like a mini DBQ. Okay. And a DBQ is a database question. You're going to analyze this political cartoon that you see right here using tacos, time, action, caption, object, summary, and then answer the question here. Do you think this cartoon is for British imperialism or is it against British imperialism? How do you know? Let me know. Um, based on your analysis of this cartoon, um, what, do you, what you think. Also, keep in mind that this down here is the caption for this political cartoon. All right. Thank you for tuning in. I will see you in the next lesson. Peace.